بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته The topic for tonight's session is, as you mentioned, learn to recite. But at the same time, how that learning to recite the Qur'an can take us to loving the Qur'an and eventually living the Qur'an. And learning, loving to recite the Qur'an and living to recite the Qur'an, the Book of Allah. And in order to start this talk off, start this session, this discussion off properly, and put everyone in the right mindset, I wanted to focus in on the overlying theme the major theme of today's discussion. And that is the Qur'an is the most amazing. The Qur'an is the greatest gift bestowed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon humanity, upon mankind. The Qur'an is the greatest form of Allah's mercy that humanity has ever witnessed or ever experienced. And it is the greatest gift of Allah that has ever been granted to mankind. And this is elaborated upon, this is demonstrated within the first part of maybe one of the most beautiful, powerful, vivid, graphic surahs of the entire Qur'an. And that is Surah Al-Rahman. When you read Surah Al-Rahman, we all know about the beauty of Surah Al-Rahman. And it's an extremely powerful portion of the Qur'an, wherein Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over and over and over emphasizes a very powerful point. He says something over and over again, فَبِأَيِّ آلَاءِ رَبِّكُمَا تُكَذِّبَانِ then which of the blessings, the great, undeniable blessings of your Lord and your Master will both of you deny, meaning human and jinn. And Allah repeats this statement over and over again. And in between continues to mention amazing, mind-blowing blessings of Allah, great gifts and bounties and blessings of Allah that we can never truly appreciate or really thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for, as He deserves to be thanked for those blessings. But here comes the real interesting part. The beginning of the surah opens very powerfully. From the very beginning, the surah grabs your attention. And it mentions Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it opens with the name of Allah. And if you look throughout the Qur'an, you don't find another surah that begins in this manner. There's no surah that begins by mentioning either the name of Allah, or begins by mentioning one of the attributes of Allah. No other surah. This is the single, this is the only surah. It begins by saying, Ar-Rahman. Ar-Rahman. This is the only surah in the entire Qur'an that does that. With the bang, it begins just, there is no more stronger, more powerful beginning that could ever be. Ar-Rahman. And then what attribute? It didn't even mention the name of Allah. It mentioned the specific attribute of Allah. Ar-Rahman. Which of course comes from Rahma, mercy. Mercy that is a force of bringing things together, bringing things closer. So Allah's mercy and Rahmah brings us closer to Him. And Rahman, the Arabic language is a language of patterns. It's a language of patterns. You take a root word and you place it on different patterns and you achieve different meanings and different implications because of each pattern. Rahman, the implication of this specific word pattern is abundance. It implies great abundance, endless amounts of something. That's why Qur'an is called Qur'an, because it's abundantly recited. So Rahman means the one who is abundantly merciful. The, ones who, the one whose mercy knows no bounds. The one whose mercy cannot be contained. The one whose mercy is limitless. Because the entire next, the rest of the surah is about to count down some of the most amazing blessings of Allah, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. Because as Allah tells us another place in the Qur'an, وَإِن تَعُدُّوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْسُوهَا Even if, hypothetically, even if you were to try to enumerate one by one count all the blessings of Allah. And what's interesting is the word ni'ma is a singular word, but it has a plural meaning as well. It's just muljins. It, encomp- it encompasses everything that falls in the category of being ni'ma. So, but wh- why Allah uses the singular? Because he's saying that not only if you try to count all the blessings of Allah, even if you try to truly appreciate one single blessing of Allah, you'd never be fully able to do so. You can never really realize the blessings of Allah. Like our eyesight. We know it's a blessing of Allah because you couldn't drive, you couldn't see, you couldn't take care of yourself. But we don't even realize to what extent vision is a blessing. Imagine never having seen the sky. Imagine never having seen how green grass is. 
We were, we were, we've been driving around all day today visiting friends, old friends and acquaintances and meeting with the shuyukh during the day. And it's been so distracting to even try to drive. MashaAllah here in SoCal. Because every time we're driving and we look up, we see the snow-capped mountains in the distance. And then we talk to each other about, can we move to SoCal? <laughs> right? And then we remember that we have families back in Dallas. Right? Otherwise we would just stay. It's so beautiful. Imagine never having seen those mountains. The snow caps. The beautiful trees. The sunlight. We saw this mountain, uh, shortly before uh, sunset, we saw this snow-capped mountain and literally the clouds had parted a little bit over the mountain. There was light coming straight down on like the snow part of the mountain. It was so amazing, so beautiful. Subhanallah. Imagine never having seen that. For those of you who are married, alright, you have a spouse, a partner in life. Imagine never having seen the person that you love so much, that you spend your entire life with, never having actually seen their face. For those of you who have children, I haven't gotten a chance to do so, so Mubarak brother Abdullah, mashallah. The birth of his daughter, I got the text message. So, but imagine those, pe those people here who have children. Do, anyone who has a child can attest to this, the most beautiful thing in the entire world is the face of your child. The innocence. It's, it's the most beautiful thing in the world. You could have the worst day of your life. Imagine the worst day of your life. And you walk through your door and the second you see the face of your child, it's all gone. There's nothing more beautiful. Removes all your worries. Now imagine not having the ability to see and never having seen the face of your child. What a blessing. So Ar-Rahman... Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the rest of the surah, He's going to count down His most amazing blessings. And He starts by mentioning the greatest blessing. And what is the next ayah? عَلَّمَ Quran. He taught the Qur'an. He taught the Qur'an. Taught who the Qur'an? خَلَقَ insan. The third ayah says He created the human being. What's very interesting about that is think about it from at least at our level of logic. Not true intelligence, because we're going to understand obviously the divine wisdom is superior to everything. But just basic logic, basic rationale. Which one does basic logic say should have been mentioned first? Creating the human being or teaching him the Qur'an? Creating the human being. He created the human being and then taught him the Qur'an. Allah doesn't say that though. He says He taught him the Qur'an and He created the human being. In reverse. And like I said, basic logic at the surface level, you say that's backwards. But when we actually take a look at it, we realize something very profound. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that a human being cannot even realize his humanity unless and until he understands the Qur'an. He implements the Qur'an. He reads the Qur'an. He understands the Qur'an. Until and unless this human being's life, his conduct, his behavior, is enlightened by the Qur'an and its beauty and its message and its teachings and its morals and its ethics, a human being can't even really live a life of true humanity. He lacks in his humanity without the Qur'an. So to be an actual true human being, we need the Qur'an. And, and another thing about that, when you buy a new item, when you ha buy, purchase something, you have to assemble, you have to put together. What does it always come with? An instruction manual. And what's the first thing you take a look at and you read? An instruct the instruction manual, you take a look at it. If you don't take a look at the instruction manual first, then that's when you end up with, right? A bookshelf that was supposed to be a table. Right? Somehow it's a bookshelf now. Alhamdulillah, we're gonna make it work. We have to make it work. Right? That's, that's when you run into issues and problems. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, before you unpackage this human being, and you realize your true humanity, first read the instruction manual, and that is the Qur'an. Your maker, your creator, your sustainer, your provider, your lord, your master, He sent you the instruction manual. Make sure you read it. 
Make sure you realize it. You live your life according to it. Don't assemble the table, assemble the crib, the bed, without reading the instruction manual. Similarly, don't think that you can live life without this instruction manual, the Qur'an. عَلَّمَ Quran, خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانِ And then what's the next thing Allah says? عَلَّمَهُ bayan. And then He taught him. And then He taught him Al-Bayan. Bayan in the air typically is just translated as speech. Bayan means very cl- clear speech, clarifying speech. Speech that is extremely clear and clarifies things. That's what the word bayan means. So once again, after this human being realizes his humanity, by means of the Qur'an, he then gains the ability to clearly, to properly elaborate and explain his purpose of life, his existence. And this points us to in another direction, that once we realize the Qur'an and we understand the Qur'an, and we live the Qur'an, it then becomes our responsibility to deliver the Qur'an. Explain this Qur'an, teach this Qur'an to people. Deliver it to mankind and humanity. Share it with everyone else. عَلَّمَهُ bayan. Clarify it. Explain yourself. Tell people about this amazing, meaningful existence that you've been able to find by means of this book of Allah. This is the greatest, that's why I say, it's the greatest gift ever bestowed by Allah upon humanity. وَنُنَزِّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاءٌ Allah says we are revealing from the Qur'an that which is a complete cure-all. Shifa means a complete cure. وَرَحْمَةٌ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ And it is a mercy for those people who believe in it. مَا كَانَ حَدِيثًا يُفْتَرَى The Qur'an is not some random fairy tale, some conjecture, someone dreamed up, somebody fantasized about. وَلَكِنْ تَصْدِيقَ الَّذِي بَيْنِ يَدَيْهِ Rather the Qur'an affirms reality. The Qur'an opens humanity's, people's eyes to what is reality. وَتَفْصِيلَ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ And the Qur'an provides an elaborate structure within which a human being can live his life and achieve a meaningful existence. وَهُدًا And the Qur'an is guidance through and through. The Qur'an is guidance in any and all situations, at all times, at all places, in all situations. وَرَحْمَةً and the Qur'an is mercy at all times, at all places, in all situations. It is the most divine, sweetest form of mercy. لِقَوْمِ يُؤْمِنُونَ For people who are willing to believe in it. People who approach it with an open mind and an open heart. قُلْ هُوَ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا هُدًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet wasallam at the end of the instruction on giving, giving him instruction on how to do the da'wah. How to deliver the message. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him, say, announce, proclaim to the people, huwa lilladheena amanu hudan wa shifa. It is for those people who are willing to believe in it, guidance and a complete cure. وَالَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ فِي آذَانِهِمْ وَقْرٌ But for those people who are not willing to believe in it, it's like an obstacle, like there's something blocking their ears. They don't hear the truth of it. وَهُوَ عَلَيْهِمْ عَمَا and they're literally blind to the Qur'an. And it's specifically the, st- the syntax, the grammar, the sentence structure is such, it means they are only blind to it. This is the only thing that they're blind to. They see everything else. They, they're, they're functioning people. They have careers and jobs and educations and families and everything. But they just don't see the truth of the Qur'an. أُولَٰئِكَ يُنَادَوْنَ مِن مَكَانٍ بَعِيدٍ Beautiful expression in the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it's like yelling at someone from very, very far away. When someone's really, really far away from you, and they're yelling something to you, can you completely understand what they're saying? It's hard to hear them, right? Like, what, what? I can't hear you, I can't hear you, come close. Right? Allah is saying that's what guidance becomes for these type of people. They just faintly hear something in the distance. But we have to approach it. We have to realize what a true gift and a true blessing of Allah it is. And we have to appreciate it. And we have to give it its due right. And we have to engage with the Qur'an. If we are really truly ever going to realize how much it can enhance and it can um, enrich our lives. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As the Shaykh has very eloquently put, it's not just about knowing that Qur'an is a gift, but knowing that the gift is meant for us. You know that there are exotic gifts there, but when we realize this gift is for us, then we realize we have to learn to use it. So when you get a very nice, amazing gift, 
Allah Quran, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that He's given us this book and He's taught this book to us, then we need to realize that this gift needs to be assembled correctly and we need to learn to, let's say, drive it correctly. So just to get a quick touch from where we are right now, how many people were at yesterday's khutbah? Just so you don't have too many repeats. So bear with me for like three, four minutes inshallah, just to get everyone caught up to where we were. And how many people were at last night's, uh, the last night's Irvine Masjid talk? Bismillah, we just want to get everyone caught up to where we were, so you can feel free to answer and get everyone caught up together. Bismillah ta'ala. So in the last two talks, we realized, we spoke about the fact that Qur'an was something that we needed. And we said there were five things it wanted from us. And the first thing that we said, what was the first thing that Qur'an wanted from us? Was to? To recite it. اِقْرَأْ بِاسْمِ رَبِّكَ الَّذِي خَلَقُ And we all know this. Qur'an needs to be read. It needs to be recited. But four times in the surah that comes after surah Rahman, and I'd like you to do a little bit of homework, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says four times in 40 ayahs, وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنِ That certainly, definitely, وَلَقَدْ Double emphasis. We have made this Qur'an simple. لِذِّكْرِ For remembrance. And what is the question? فَهَلْ مِنْ مُدَّكِرِ So who is going to step up to the plate? But what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say the Qur'an was? What did He say? وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنِ Right? It's easy. I'd like to demonstrate that to you. This is something we did last night. We demonstrated that any human being could learn the letters of the Qur'an in 28 minutes and we told an actual story. Some of the brothers came and said, did that really happen? Did the lady sit next to you on the plane and say, can I learn to say jihad? And this happened. So a lady came on the plane and she asked me, she said, what do you do? And I said, oh, I used to work in the hospital and now I work, I teach Arabic. And she said, in the air, she said, can you teach me to say jihad? And I said, uh, and I did exactly this. I pressed my call button. I called the Southwest lady and I said, the white lady said jihad, I did not say jihad. So she was okay, she was okay. And then she said, okay, she walked away. And I said, ma'am, I can't teach you that word, but there's 75 minutes left on our flight. God said, and I'm telling myself this, the coach inside, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, this book is easy. He's gonna make it easy to remember. So I'm gonna teach you the letters of the Arabic language in 28 minutes. And she was thinking, she said, okay, let's do it. And she was wondering, well, maybe Arabic letters make up the word jihad, so I'm gonna take it. So what I did was, again, I was about to whip out something technical, I took out a piece of paper. I took out a napkin, the napkin that we get our drinks on, and this is very important. And I want you to get, remember, that what I'm showing you here is why Quran is so simple. So I took the napkin out, and on the napkin I drew a line, a straight line. Right? And we know what that line is. That line is the letter Alif. But I asked her, ma'am, what do you see? She said, I see a stick. I said, where does the stick come from? She said, a tree. It looks like a tree. And then when I said, ma'am, what grows on a tree? What did she say? Yesterday, people jump in. She said, a leaf. She said, a leaf. I said, that is correct. Then, very quickly, let's move through this. Then I drew, she said, a leaf. I said, very good. So when you look at the tree, know what a leaf grows on it? I asked her one more. What else grows on a tree? She said an apple. Khalas. A leaf, apple, a. Ah. Then I drew three boats. Three boats. Started here, you know, like a little canoe. I drew three little boats and then I made six dots. I made six dots. I said, these are the little boys. They want to play in the boat. So the first boat, I put one boy at the bottom of the boat. And you know what she said? She said, boy, bottom boat. And I said, ba. Then I said, ma'am, how many boys are in the second boat? After ba, how many boys in the second boat? Two, right? And we did this yesterday. I made her repeat it a few times. I said, I'm sorry, ma'am, how many? And she said, two. I I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Well, she said, two. I said, ma'am, there are two boys in the boat. And she said, two. And I said, da. So she said, a leaf, boy, two. And then the th I, I did this. I put my tongue here and I said jokingly, ma'am, how many boys in the third boat, in the third. So she caught the joke and she said, three, three. And I said, tha, tha. So she said, Alif, boy, two, three. Then I took my cup, just like this. It was a regular cup, and I did that with the cup. It was an empty cup. So I said, this is a jug. 
The cup was a jug. I said, ma'am, what's in the jug? Oh, it has a dot. It's full. I said, it's a full jug. And she said, jug. And what did I say? Jeem. I said, ja. Then I took my cup and I turned it upside down. I said, ma'am, what's inside my cup after jeem? The next jug, what's inside of it? Nothing. It's hollow. It's a hollow jug. And she said, hollow, yes. And I said, ha, like hollow. And then I took my cup, and it was a plastic, you know the plastic cups you get your orange juice in? And I crushed it in my hand. And I said, look ma'am, the third jug, it has a scratch. When I said scratch, what did she say? So I said, jug, hollow, scratch. And she said to me, a leaf, boy, two, three. Three. Jug, hollow, scratch. And I said, what sound does the scratch make? She said, khaw. I put two things down and then I showed her, we did a lot more letters. And we did dal, then I pulled up on my zipper, I took my, the zipper that was connected to the end of my coat. And I said, when I close my zipper, does it go zzzz? She did it herself, she bought her tongue here and said zzzz. I said, say zipper. She said za, za. Then I drew a little tail of a lion. And I said, ma'am, if you pull on this tail, what will the lion say? What does the lion say? Raw. And usually people say roar. So she said roar. And I said, if, you, if a lion walks up to you and goes roar, it'll probably say, that's slightly agitating. Don't pull on my tail. <laughs> right? So lions don't say roar. Homeboy, what does the lion say? Little guy, what does the lion say? Raw. And immediately she said raw. I drew the next letter. I said, it's a bumblebee. What sound does it make? She goes buzz. And I said, when it bites you, what do you say? She said, ah. Z, a, za. So the lion says ra, the bumblebee says za. I drew binoculars like this. I said, ma'am, if I look into these binoculars, what have I done? And she said, I have seen. And I said, if you look into the binoculars and you've seen the three little boys from the boat, what do you have to tell them? So she said, a leaf boy, two, three, jug, hollow, scratch, da, zipper, a lion says ra, bumblebee says z, a. I have seen three boys, so I told them, shh, and I said, to build this plane, we need nails, hammer, and a saw. And she goes, yeah, saw. And I drew the letter. It has a handle and the blade. I said, the blade is dull. It's a dull blade. So she looked at the letter ba, and she said, da, da. I was like, okay, it's pretty close. Then sisters, I drew the letter ta, and I said, it looks like a lamb chop. And she goes, I said, what do you do with the lamb chop when you pull it out of the freezer? And she looked at me, and she got the... She got the point. She goes, the lamb chop has to fall. And we went, we kept going. And in 20, before 75 minutes uh, finished, in 28 minutes, big, big perm. Big, big, big hair. And she goes, I know the Arabic letters. And I said, you know why you know the Arabic letters? Because God says in His book four times. And I recited. وَلَنْقَدْ يَسَّرْنَ الْقُرْآنِ Definitely, certainly, this book's simple. This Quran, it's simple. And quite frankly, it's pretty fun. Because I asked her, if you're sneezing, you usually have a bad cough. And when a cow has a baby, it's called, and it's the only letter with a little baby in the stomach. When a cow has a baby, what is it called? Calf. And I said, Mary had a little lamb. And we got to the letter, the, this letter, and it looks like a man opening his mouth. And I was like, how easy is Arabic? And what did she say? Wow! And she was sold, and we were done. And she's all like, I know I can't shake your hand, but I was like, be happy, clap your hands. <laughs> Just be, you're, she said, you're a hairy guy, religious people don't shake. I said, well, okay, whatever. <laughs> whatever floats your boat. But this is where Quran in the first level. Now, why am I pitching this to you? Because anyone between now and January 21st who wants to attain this gift, friends, you have 21 days give or take, to learn from zero. So, Sheikh Ma, can you, can you uh, volunteer? Can you volunteer? This brother in the Kufi, he doesn't know his letters at all. Am I right? You've never seen the letters in your life? The one in the Kufi. You've never seen the letters in your life, right? Nod, just nod. Very good. Checks in the mail, don't worry. So he's never seen the letters in his life. If he wanted to, before January 21st, he could learn to read out of an Arabic mushaf. Pick up the script, not A-L-I-F business, Alhamdulillah. 
he could pick up an Arabic mushaf and read it and Shaykh will explain to us a little bit more. So, um, <clears throat> one of uh, Wissam's uh, earliest, um, I guess, research or some of the work that he sat down and he did was developing this course that he just kind of gave you a brief synopsis of. It was basically our Arabic 101 course. It's called Reading Essentials. So, and this was uh, a course that he developed that used to be taught over eight evenings. Uh, the last time I think he taught it, he actually taught it in Brooklyn. He taught it in Brooklyn at Imam Siraj's Masjid. Imam Siraj Wahaj's Masjid in Brooklyn. And uh, I was on the phone with him. I actually, he actually turned on the phone during the class. It was the fourth evening. By the way, when I say fourth day of class, it's only an hour and a half a day. Only an hour and a half a day. And it was the fourth evening of the class. He turned on the phone and that was the day. There was almost like 200 people there. 200 people. You know, most of them converts. People who had taken Shahada, some of them 20, 30 years ago. They were part of Imam Siraj's old school crew. And but, you know, just over time, it was difficult for them to learn how to, how to read the Arabic directly out of the Mus'haf. And on the fourth day of class, they started reading, putting words together, Hasada, Khalaqa. And literally there was like shouting and yelling and screaming in the room. They were so excited. People were throwing things, people were running around the room. Back and forth. Back and forth. <laughs> Allah Akbar and started running around the room. And they're hugging each other and it, it was such an exciting moment. So Alhamdulillah, it, it's really, uh, personally I think out of um, all the courses we've done, it's probably the most life changing, the most life altering, and the most fundamental basic thing that is the need of people. But the reality of the matter is that traveling around, and it has to be done in incremental um, you know, um, portions and sections. You can't condense it into a two-day course because it takes that time to digest it slowly. It's something new that the person is learning. So it became difficult for him to travel around and teach this course in every single location wherever somebody would have this need. And there's usually if not that many people, 10, 15 people per city that actually come out and take the, this type of a course. So what we ended up doing was we ended up hiring <clears throat> some professional media people who recorded the entire course. And they used uh, HD video, they used some interactive technology <clears throat> to the point where the letters are on the screen. His lovely face is on the screen right next to the letters. Um, he's reading it, he's instructing like he was just teaching right now. And he's circling things and it, we ended up producing a DVD course. A DVD course, it's a three DVD course. And it's called Reading Essentials. And we ended up producing this DVD and it's available on, on the Begina site. You can find it at dvd.begina.com. The reason why I'm mentioning this is because this DVD set needs to be within each and every single home. Make your kids sit down and watch it. You yourself refresh your ability to read by taking the DVD course. Also at the same time, when people come into the masjid and they take shahada, there's so many things that we give to them or that we should give to them. I, I, I honestly truly believe this should be one of the primary gifts provided to people when they accept Islam. And I, uh, one of the locations where I taught a class, I met two sisters. There were two sisters who had taken shahada around the same time about two years ago. Before they took my class, Meaningful Prayer, the one I taught over here. And both of these sisters took shahada around the same time. One of the sisters in the class had troubles keeping up with the class. And if you've taken the seminar, you know I don't really impose a lot of heavy Arabic into the course. I explain everything as we go along, we're translating as we go along. But she had trouble keeping up because even the few Arabic words that would come on the screen, she would have trouble piecing them together. She, need every, she needed everything transliterated. A-L-H-A-M-D-U-L-L -L She needed everything transliterated. And the other sister, during one of the breaks, came to me with a mushaf holding a Qur'an in her hand and started asking me advanced grammatical questions from the Qur'an. And I was like, oh my goodness, who are you? Right? Like, where'd you come from? And when talking to both the sisters, she came to me during the break with her frustration. I'm having trouble keeping up. Uh, I said, how, how long ago did you accept Islam? Two years ago. Didn't learn how to read the Arabic. No, unfortunately didn't. I went straight to transliteration. I learned how to pray through A-L-L-A-H-U-A-K-B-A-R. I learned how to pray like that and it became a permanent crutch. And I haven't been able to let go since. 
On the other hand, the other sister, when I spoke to her, find out how long ago did you t- accept Islam? Two years ago. Subhanallah, advanced grammatical questions from the Quran, wow. She said the greatest blessing was that I talked to somebody sensible after I took shahada, and they told me, listen, it's going to be a little bit more, require a little bit more work in the beginning, but don't go to transliteration. Go directly to the Arabic. Learn alif ba ta ta. It'll take a little more work, a little more commitment, a little more patience in the beginning, but it'll pay off later. And she said, I did that. And within a couple of weeks, a month or so, I was reading directly from the Mus'haf. And I kept improving my recitation. And I started memorizing Qur'an. Then I took a grammar course locally from the Shaykh at our masjid. Then I signed up for some online grammar classes. And I just kept going from there. And now I'm, I'm, just, I'm a student of the grammar of the Qur'an. And I was like, subhanAllah. What a di- completely different story. So really these, these uh, DVDs that we've produced, um, we, we've made available on our website. Please do go to the website. They do require a purchase, but I'm, I, I can guarantee it's the best investment, inshallah, you'll ever make. So please do check that part of it out. But now once you identify the letters, you know how to read the letters, the next layer of this reciting the Qur'an is of course the sound, the proper pronunciation. Now let Hafid Wissam talk about that a little bit. And for those of you who are, this is probably the main uh, core part of the talk tonight. I want you to realize that what we're going to do right now are some of the techniques we employ in the actual class. So if you want to, you can write this down. If you want to uh, like take a, jot these things down. I'm not proposing that your reading could get better. I'm saying take this home tonight, more than the last class, use these techniques at home, and see your recitation change tonight. Before you leave, make two rakat nawafil and see if it changes. And by the way, that DVD set, very quickly, it won't teach you the letters. It will teach you the letters and how to read out of an Arabic script from zero in an hour and a half a day for eight days. But let's see if we can do about four mini lessons together. So the first thing Qur'an wanted from us was, اِقْرَأْ بِاسْمِ رَبِّكَ الَّذِي خَلَقُ خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ عَلَقُ What was the second thing that Qur'an wanted from us? Does anyone remember from the khutbah? It was the second khutbah. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks. I feel wonderful. I feel wonderful. Thanks a lot. Just next time say you didn't come to my khutbah, you'll be like, yeah, we listened to the Shaykh khutbah. What was the second revelation, second or third? Remember we talked about it. Rasulullah came down. He was wrapped in his cloak. He was slightly anxious. He told his wife, Zambiluni. What did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala call to him as? Ya ayyuhal muzammil. And in the fourth ayah of this recitation, second or third revelation to mankind in some opinions, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to His beloved, Of all things that are going to be said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and recite the Qur'an slowly, calculated, and with rhythm. Imam Qurtubi, he comments on this, that tartila is the perfect arrangement of the teeth with no gaps between it. But that doesn't mean a lot to me. So let's take this one little science for a second. I recite it to you and a lot of you said, Oh, mashallah. But as, it's okay, because you got lost in the sound of Qur'an, that's fine. But I'm asking you, did I recite... Or did I recite Tartila? I recited the first one. So how do I know whether the sound is A or A? How do I know if the sound is Tar or Tar? How do I know these things without knowing technical terms? So the second obligation after reciting the Qur'an is to recite it. وَالْأَخْذُ بِالتَّجْوِيدِ حَتْمُ الْلَازِمِ As Imam Jaziri writes in his beautiful opening to the poem, the implementation of Tajweed, حَتْمُ lazim. It is imp- It's it's almost obligatory in a non fard way. It's mandatory because it was revealed with it. Qur'an was revealed with the right pronunciation. He didn't say Qur'an was revealed with tajweed. It was revealed with it because they're synonymous. The correct pronunciation. Now let's push the bar a little bit. Everybody knows that we're supposed to recite Qur'an correctly. But there's the convert, there's the Arab, the non-Arab, and then Allah only knows what fits in between. But there must be something in between too. The South Indian. We're going to have their own category. Allah bless the dirty South. 
in this, there are many things that stop us. The average person stops because, well, I was born Arab, my makharij is perfect, khalas, I leave it alone. The non-Arab says, I don't know Arabi, and he's the, he leaves it alone. I'm not Arabi. And then someone says, well, I was born into this religion here in America, I don't have a means to understand it. So I want to do four lessons quickly. Today, leave this room knowing that Tajweed, first lesson, Tajweed, the science wasn't written or codified till 150 years after the death of Rasulullah So if it wasn't a written science, how was the sound of Qur'an taught for the first 150 years? Orally, right? Some people, they, they don't humor me. So it was, it was committed orally. So when someone came, there were three major lessons I want to touch. First lesson, Tajweed is not a bunch of names and rules. Right? When Khaltu Badia teaches her class here, I think it's on sun, Wednesday, Monday, Wednesday, and Sunday, the memorization class, you're not, how many, how many people take that class? How many, how many technical rules do you cover, sister? You don't do a lot of rules. What do you do more, recitation or rules? Recitation, right? Because recitation's first. Everyone in this room says, but brother, I can't understand mufakham and muraqqaq, and I can't implement it. So everyone in the room now, let's try one thing. Let's try to... Irving gave me a lot of love last night. Can you... Yeah. Irvine, sorry. That's how much love they gave me. I didn't even know their name when I left. That's how much love I got. I'm going to say seven sounds, okay? Everyone repeat one word in English. Can you say awesome? Can you say awesome? One more time. Awesome. Now, I'm going to say it one more time to you. Listen to the fact that I'm saying it the way you say it in California. Awesome. Now, very important, this is not part of a joke. In Boston, how do they say awesome? They use their lips and they say awesome. Right? They say awesome. They drink coffee on the corner. Right? They drive in the parkway. They use their lips. I want you to say it like a Californian. Everyone say awesome. Now, listen to seven sounds in the Quran. Ta, sa, da, ta, va, ga, kha. What are all seven of these letters? They're all awesome. Now you learned one lesson. You learned that there are seven awesome sounds. You correct, my, I'm you. Now if I say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. What's the mistake? The Ayn. Ayn isn't? Done. Kala. Qul a'udhu bi Rabbin Nas. You'll say, hmm, ta sa da ta da ga ka. Noon ain't awesome. If noon tried, he couldn't be awesome. Noon is happy. Noon is a happy letter. So there are seven awesome sounds in the Quran. If they're awesome, then you know them to be as an aw sound. But if they are happy, then every other letter in the Quran except lam and ra are all happy. When I say, Alam tara kaifa fa ala rabbuka bi ashabil fil Most letters are happy or awesome? Happy. Most letters are happy. Except when I said tara, ra, kaifa fa ala rabbra, ra, buka bi ashabil fil Okay, so this is pretty simple. I can say happy. Let's do another one. Everyone in this room falls under two major categories. Most of you say, Alhamdulillah, you can recite well. All of us either recite, Bismillah. Let's try one example. 50% of the room recites, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Bismillah. La. The other 50%, and Shaykh and Khaltu Badia, you can totally back me up on this. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So it's either La. Or le. So we did one sentence. Everyone, can you repeat this sentence? This cat feels cool. This cat feels cool. So try it one more time. Say, a, e, u. So one more time. Cat feels cool. Now remember, what this cat, he, I mean, he, he feels cool. So when he says, this cat feels cool. The enunciated sound. Now see what this sentence can do. Sometimes you hear someone say, Bismillah, 
the fatha makes an at sound a uh. so everyone say bismillah now you could have heard bismillah but that's not la you could have heard bismillah let's take another example alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin alhamdu how many people have ever heard that you hear it sometimes alhamdu right but if i said dal is cool cool everyone say alhamdu you notice when the brother said it he puckered his lips like the word cool how many people have heard maliki yawmiddin maliki yawmiddin you hear it all the time but lam with a line on the bottom it feels everyone say maliki do you notice the e sound if you can take awesome happy and this cat feels cool as we say your your pronunciation of the heavy and light will get better your pronunciation of even when people say bismillah be bismillah be is it be or bis it's a it's an e sound right so it sounds exaggerated now because we've been saying the cut so say bumble b the e sound bismillah la so you start realizing wow it's just as simple as cat feels cool now I can see on some of the Ammu's face, خلاص, شيخنا, مرقق, مفقم, we knew this when we were little kids. And A, E, U, we've been saying perfect. Someone in the Salah yesterday, after what Dalin, they said, Ameen, Ameen. This is the same person who said, Fatha da Makasra. Tarif. Okay, I said, no problem. Let's do something a little bit more complicated. And then inshallah, I think you'll catch it. Uh, the students for the Tajweed class, this... Uh, that is amazing. It's better than a weekend course. I can say that. Uh, brother, your study was in the class? I'm, I'm going to tell you flat out on camera in front of everyone. Taking Khaltu Badiyah's class is 50 times greater than taking a three-day three class. So know that Monday, Wednesday, Sunday, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given something in this community that maybe six communities have. That is a program full-time tajweed. But He has given this community what no other community has. And that is the teacher of that course. But I w- promise I wouldn't say too much. Can you tell me what's the most complicated rule, you think? Anyone can throw out what is the most complicated rule in Tajweed? Ikhfa and Izhar. Sheikh got it right on the head. The whole concept of an and a, it's really complicated. Right? Even Hufal don't get it right. So I want you to take Ikhfa and Izhar and put it up here on the member, let it give khutbah. Look at me for a second. Can everyone say normal? Say ninja. MashaAllah, MashaAllah. Say Nantucket. Can you say nice? Say Nancy? One more time, say normal. To say the N in normal, what did your tongue do? What did it do brother? It touched the top of your mouth. Everyone say normal. Right? Normal. Now everyone say in English, say uncle. Exaggerate, say uncle. Say ink. Say young. Say pink. Among. Now I want you to think about one word. Say young money. Would you think about that? Wait a minute. Young. Everyone say uncle. Did your tongue touch? Did you say uncle? Young uncle. What? Yink. I'll never get tired of doing that. I do that every Friday. And it works everywhere. Yink. Young uncle. You don't do that, right? So now you have two sounds. In the kunnatum, right? You don't do that. So we end on one point here, friends. We end on this, which we did last night. There are two sounds in the Arabic language. One is a tongue touch. An'amta alayhim. An'amta. Everyone, ihdina sirat al mustaqim, sirat al ladina an. Did you touch your tongue or didn't touch? Is it an'amta or an'amta? Your tongue touched. Izhar. And everyone say the word mink. Whether it's halal or haram, ask the mishayikh. Just say mink. Now say minkum. Tongue not touch. Ikhfa. If we could do that in 30 seconds, what can we do in a weekend? Think about the fact that four times in 40 verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses two taqi, two strengths. I'm going to make this easy for you to remember. Fahad min muddakir. Who's going to step up to the plate? Who's going to come and say, I'm going to learn this book. I'm going to learn 
Ar-Rahman. Now you correct my mistake. We did four lessons. I'm going to say Ar-Rahman. Correct the mistake. Meme isn't awesome. And meme has what on top of it? An A, ah, Fatha. And what sound does the Fatha make? At, Mat. Ar-Rahman. So all of a sudden, Mon, you know that, wait, meme is not awesome. Meme with a line on the top, Fatha, Zabar, Etre, Ushtu, whatever you want to call it, it makes an at sound. Done. How hard was the game of Tajweed? It was never hard until we assign names and technical terms to it. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us that opportunity. I, then, uh, I wanted to take uh, just a couple of minutes to talk about Wissam obviously demonstrated uh, very superbly about how simple and easy in reality grasping and comprehending the proper pronunciation, the proper sounds of the Qur'an, how truly simple it is, how simple it actually is. But I wanted to address then the next follow-up question. Because somebody sitting there who critically is thinking about this issue might say, okay, I understand it's easy, but is it still just an unnecessary exercise? I mean, does it make that big of a difference? The, the reality of it is, I'm, I'm talking from two basic perspectives. Wissam's going to share some specific examples with you, but I'm just addressing it generally from two specific perspectives. Two perspectives that Alhamdulillah, I've had the ability to study in depth and also teach. The first is grammar, meaning. Grammar, the lugha, the language. The change in a sound most definitely affects the meaning and uh, the meaning of what is being said. The change in a sound most definitely affects the meaning of what is being said. The second application is tafsir. The, 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 the meaning of revelation, the in-depth lessons and the wisdom that we extract from the Qur'an. And that is also, of course, if the meaning is being impacted, then the in-depth understanding and the application of the Qur'an is obviously being impacted. So there's no doubt about the fact that the abuse of the sound of the Qur'an, and I'm going to use the word abuse, and it's a very difficult word. Whenever I end up giving these type of lectures, community lectures, introductory lectures, I always try to keep the light mood and encouraging and motivating. But I like to insert maybe just a couple of minutes of what a good friend of mine calls real talk. Real talk. It's a bitter pill to swallow, it's a little bit tough, but we got to deal with reality. A good reality check is healthy from time to time. And I always apologize in advance. If I offend anyone, I sincerely, honestly apologize. My intention is not to offend or slight anyone. It affects the meaning of what we read and recite when we abuse the sound, the pronunciation of the Qur'an. The next thing someone could say is, well, I'm not doing it intentionally. You're making it sound like I sit there and I purposely alter the sound of the Qur'an to mess around with it. Brother, I'm a Muslim. I believe this to be the book of Allah. I would never dare disrespect it. But then I also, the answer to that is also very interesting. He just taught us three, four very fundamental Basically, what is the basis and the fundamentals of the proper pronunciation of the Arabic language? What he just demonstrated. And it didn't take more than 10 minutes. His entire seminar takes one weekend. So now the answer to your question is actually, it takes one weekend at the most to improve, the, to get the sound of the Qur'an, the pronunciation of the Arabic language up to par. It takes one weekend. How much time have we invested? How much energy have we spent? How much of our brain power have we invested into completely useless things? So many of our youth could tell me right now, as soon as I put out the question, so many youth could answer the question of how many points a game Kobe Bryant averages. Boom. Right off the top of your head. What's the Lakers record right now? Right? Right away, somebody could fire it out. I'm from Texas, so I won't pick on you guys. California people are kind of sensitive. Picking on us, right? I'm from Texas. We're football people. It's football country. That's where real men play. <laughs> All right?
right? Didn't think I was going to let you get away that easy. All right? No football team in LA. Shame on you people. So, I, Muslim youth, grown men, tell you right off the top of their heads, averages of the Dallas Cowboys. Right? How many yards a game? How many points a game? The quarterback, the receiver, the number of the jersey, how tall he is, how many year, years he's been in the league, how many touchdowns he has, right, right away. And then even other issues, politics. We know so much about politics. We can talk about it for hours. And all other types of use. We live in the age of useless information. The age of Wikipedia. Right? We can read about anything and everything. Information we'll never need again in our lives. We can pick it up right now on our phones. But I haven't taken out one weekend of my time. A dozen hours of my time to learn how to read the book of Allah properly? It's a tough question. But we all got to ask ourselves that question. How am I going to justify that to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How am I going to answer that to Allah that, yeah, I had, you know, I was just talking to a brother earlier today and he was saying, subhanAllah, you know, before I realized deen and I realized the importance of family and deen and salah and valuing my time, I used to watch 12 hours of football a week. 12 hours of football a week. The, 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 the 12 p.m. game, well, well, for us it's 12 p.m. in Dallas. The early game, the late game, the Sunday night game, the Monday night game. I used to watch 12 hours of football a week. A week. But I didn't have 12 hours in my lifetime to learn how to read the book of Allah, the words of Allah properly. That's the real question. That's the question we got to be asking ourselves. And it's within everyone's grasp. When Allah guarantees it's easy, it is easy. We're the ones, like He said, we're the ones who make it difficult. Otherwise, it's very, very, very easy. If I'm going barreling down the freeway, I'm going 95 miles per hour down the freeway, staring down the freeway. Cop pulls me over, going 95 in a 60. What is wrong with you? I said, I didn't know what, speed limit, what the speed limit was. I didn't know. So I was just driving. Is he still going to give me the ticket? It's my job to find out what is the speed limit. I'm supposed to look for the sign and implement it. That's the way it works. I have to make the time. And based on what we just discussed, we all have that time. We all, trust me, we all have that time. The Quran has barakah and blessing. Maybe somebody out there says, but brother, my life is tough. And I don't doubt you, definitely. Your life probably is very, very difficult. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help you and make it easy. But the Qur'an is the ultimate source of blessing. It's the word of Allah. If your intention is the Qur'an, Allah will make, put barakah in your time and He'll make it even easier for you inshaAllah. So I just wanted to real quickly, briefly address that this is a need. Fine, it's easy brother, but do I have to do it? Yes. That's not an option. We have to do it. We must do it. We should have done it. Let's not waste any more time and let's do it now. He's going to share a few examples of how it exactly impacts the meaning when we read and recite. Now to bring things to a close, this is something we didn't do yesterday. So this is something, it took a little bit of time of research and it just kind of came. Some brother said, but Allah knows what's in my heart. It doesn't really affect. I just want you to get an idea. Allah knows what's in my heart. So when I recite Quran, God knows. Let's take a simple example. And it happens usually in the Musallah where someone to give, comes to give a Quran. They come and give a Quran. So they come and say, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And they say, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And the brother says, it's Allahu Akbar. And he goes, Allahu Akbar. Yeah, I'm just making it pretty. Allahu Akbar, Allah is great. Allahu Akbar, it's the jama. It means drum. Allah is? Wrong. Now when we say Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Ha Hamidayah Madu When you make this statement Then you're saying all praise and thanks are due to Allah But when you say Alhamdu Alha You change the spicy Hallow jug Into a Ha 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 Then it means all the smoke is for Allah When I say Qul Huwa Allahu Ahad Qul Qul Right? No. 
قال يقول it's a difference when I say قل هو الله أحد قو قو you hear it قو say Allah is one the big statement that Allah is one when I say قل قل what does it mean أكلا يأكل to eat let me take it a little bit closer to home something we recite in Salah possibly every day what do we say? فَصَلِّ لِرَبِّكَ وَنْحَرُ فَصَلِّ لِرَبِّكَ وَنْحَرُ What is the فَصَلِّ لِرَبِّكَ What does that translate out into? Pray? Who, is, who are we talking about in this ayah? This is inna a'atayna, right? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam He prayed to his Lord وَنْحَرُ مَا مَانِ وَنْحَرُ Sacrifice, right? No, I'm asking you, what does it mean? Sacrifice. What does one have? La hawa. What is this? What does it mean? One have. Anyone? To scold, right? Then have. So that means if I read first, one yawabika one have ha. Rasulullah prayed to his God, to his Lord, and then what did he do? He scolded him. Now these letters make a very big difference and all of a sudden you're thinking about yourself in the car at 90 miles per hour when the cop said you didn't even look. What happens when he's looking and you, you didn't take you knew what a semiconductor was, you knew what an evil was, the car and the phone, but you didn't have the time. You could tell the difference between a fake product first and a real product first. You had time to pack, match your hijab pin to your socks, but you couldn't figure out how to read? Brother, brother, this is too much, can you please be nice? Okay, let's take one example, final example. How about when the, I, the, uh, the meaning doesn't change at all? So Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala, and I want you to look up who Abdullah bin Mas'ud is. Of the, su- of the 114 surah in the Qur'an, how many did he learn directly from the mouth of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Many. I'm just going to leave it at that, your homework. So a man was reading to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. Now this doesn't change the letters. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was teaching a man Qur'an, one of the greatest Qur'an teachers of, of, the, of the Sahaba, radiallahu ta'ala. He was moved from the capital city to Kufa during the time of Umar radiallahu ta'ala. He said, I have preferred him for you over myself. This is a great statement. So the man comes, إِنَّمَا الصَّدَقَاتُ لِلْفُطَرَاءِ he read, إِنَّ مَا الصَّدَقَاتُ لِلْفُطَرَاءِ Abdullah bin Mas'ud said, he said, لا that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم ما هكذا أقرأنيها النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم He said, ما هكذا, not like this The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم ما هكذا أقرأنيها he didn't read like this. So the man asked him, So how did he read? And I, I wish I could narrate the whole hadith, but I won't step out of my bounds and try to make myself look cool. Wallahi, that's what it's going to be. But I will say this much. So the companion said, So how did, so the man said, How did Rasulullah read it? He said, إِنَّمَا الصَّدَقَاتُ لِلْ Fuqara and Famaddaha and he made mud on it. So if the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala an forget about changing letters, friends. They didn't even move the a uh, to a uh, or the a uh, to a. Uh. They didn't even change these sounds. Then who are we going to be to remove the signs? And I wish I could I, I feel comfortable because the Shaykh is here too, Mashayah sit, so I feel comfortable saying this in the masjid. Friends. Three examples. If I came up here and I said, drop it like it's cold, because I want to be a young thousand, hundred thousand dollar nair, and I just don't care, because my name is Snoop Little Wayne. Right? If I misquoted a song and I said, drop it like it's cold. Right? If I said, this is my pediatric dream in my very baggy jeans, this is wonderful. You know what you would say? Wow, what a fob. He doesn't know what he's talking about. If I quoted, and once I tried to quote a couplet from Um Kulthum in a lecture, I was trying to make a point, and I messed up the nazam of Um Kulthum's words, they said, Allah, Allah, 
The people said, please stop. Yeah. They said, please stop. Sheikh, we understood that we supported. Please stop. And for the rest who are, th- who's Um Kulthum? If I got up here and I said a Lata song, right? Or I took a big Rafi, uh, I started say, quoting Rafi's or the old Nazams of um, Iqbal. And I quoted his poem incorrectly. Toba karo, toba karo. Chichi karo, chichi. Right? If I got up here and God forbid I sang a song incorrectly, brother, brother, you're killing it. When your dad is humming along in the car to something, you're like, dad, stop. You're killing it. When it comes to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the book will be our death on the day of judgment. The book will come and say, this man, he read me correctly. The man will be dragged on his face to the hellfire, but he will have memorized Surah Mulk. Surah Mulk will manifest and say, Allah, I am in him. You put him in hell, will you put me in hell? And for this proper recitation, he'll be entered into the paradise. And there will be others who the Qur'an is a shahada against them. So if I can't quote Lata up here, if I can't quote Little Wayne, or the people who bring fahsha into our life incorrectly, how can I read the book of Allah incorrectly? I wanted to end now, inshallah, just by mentioning a few basic things um, to tell you about the course. But the first thing, just as a closing uh, point and as closing remarks, our entire discussion here today has been in regards to just the first tier. Just the first requirement, the first demand that the Qur'an makes from us, and that is to recite it properly. There's so many more responsibilities that are after that. The next demand, the next obligation that we have towards the Qur'an, is to memorize it, so that it is in our hearts. The third obligation of the Qur'an upon us, is that we understand it. We comprehend its meaning, its depth. It's beauty, it's magnificence, it's power, it's message. The fourth obligation of the Qur'an then after that, so technically the fifth obligation of the Qur'an then upon us, is to live it, to realize it, to practice it. Like the, the wife of the Prophet ﷺ says about him, كَانَ خُلُقُهُ Quran. His lifestyle, his behavior, his character was the Qur'an. He lived it. And then the final obligation of the Qur'an upon us is to share this Qur'an, this truth, this manifest truth with all of humanity. All these obligations are upon us. But just the first level has just been an introduction to it has been our entire discussion here tonight and that is to recite it properly. So in conclusion to this, inshaAllah, we will be conducting a one weekend seminar here at Masjid Umar al Farooq, inshaAllah, on the weekend of January 21 through the 23rd. Janu- January the 21st through the 23rd. Alright, inshaAllah, th- this seminar will be conducted here. If you want more information on the seminar, you can go to bayina.com. There are these flyers outside. Alright, these lovely beautiful flyers, they're on the table here, they're in the lobby, they're at the registration tables that are going to be available for sisters and for brothers afterwards. This this flyer gives you all information you need. It tells you tajweed.bayina.com. This takes you to the page that has a video, has testimonials, has information, everything you need to know about the course. It tells you where you can register for the course. It tells you the timings and the location of the course. All the information is here, so grab one of these. I always like to tell people in these lectures, listening to a lecture is lots of fun, it's good, it's informative, it's engaging, it's beneficial. But you know, there comes a time when we have to spring into action, we have to do something. And, and so I always like to give the brothers and sisters that attend these lectures some type of an action item, what you can practically go home and do. You obviously have a major action item. The few lessons he taught today, try to implement them. The second action item, that make sure that you come here. I just want you to remember one date and one time. I don't want to confuse you with Saturday and Sunday and this. Be here Friday, the January, January the 21st at 7 p.m. Friday, January 21st, 7 p.m. Be here at that time. 
ready to inshallah learn, have a good time and benefit and improve your relationship with the book of Allah, thereby fortifying your relationship with Allah Himself. It is His word, His kalam. So be here at 7 p.m. Friday, January the 21st. The third action item I'd like to give you and we'll end with that inshallah, I'll let the shaykh uh, take over. And that is spread the word to other people. It's a form of sadaqah jariyah. It'll be a reward for you. Take not one, but take maybe five flyers. Give them to a friend, a brother, a sister, uh, a co-worker, a neighbor, an uncle, an aunt, someone. Someone you know that would benefit from this but was not here tonight, go and give them the flyer and inshallah invest into your own akhirah as well. Uh, fr- the Friday evening program, Friday, January 21st, 7 p.m. It's an open session, open to the entire community. Come out, bring your family, bring everyone inshallah and come in, inshallah. Surah Al-Fatiha, the proper recitation of Surah Al-Fatiha will be taught Friday evening. So you definitely Friday evening will be going home with something meaningful. Alright, Jazakumullah khairan. Thank you very much for being patient and listening to us. Shaykh Faqih inshallah is going to... And on my closing note, just uh, don't get the opportunity to do this a lot, but I want to connect all the dots. I spoke about the importance of Tajweed and the Shaykh left us on memorization. In what order did we talk about? Did we say memorization Tajweed or Tajweed memorization? We said Tajweed memorization. Some parents from every part of the world, we don't understand that our child needs to read correctly before they can memorize. And the system being employed here at the uh, institute, the Quran school here, the Institute of Quran, it is the correct system of learning. Where your child, yes, maybe you think they read great, but they learn to read correctly because they are learning the letters, they are learning to pronounce, and then they are learning to memorize. So take advantage of that, and sometimes we don't like the medication, but it makes us feel better. Take advantage of what you have in front of you, because I'm telling you as two people whose job it is to fly around the United States, you, don't, you have a, a, a class and a school and a teacher that other massages don't. Jazakallah khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. I'll see you on the 21st here at the Masjid.